when we last reported, John Wisdom was just outside Rome in the Vans Valley area, having last switched horses at the Six Mile community. We then received a report that his horse stumbled in the dark, fell, and that Wisdom might have been injured. Well, that did not turn out to be true. Shaken, bruised, but not hurt seriously, Wisdom rode on, and at this moment we are standing at the end of the large covered wooden bridge over the Etowah River in South Rome, waiting for this intrepid rider and his tired horse. And, in fact, I believe he's coming through the bridge as we speak. Let me, let me try to make contact. Mr. Wisdom! Mr. Wisdom! Is that you? Yeah, yes, it's me. Can you tell me how I can wake up this town? I got serious news for the citizens here. I would suggest, sir, that you might go to the hotel on Broad Street. Mr. Black is the night innkeeper, and he could offer you some help. Thanks. I wish I had more time to talk. We've got to wake up this town. Well, there goes John Wisdom entering the history book of this nation, having just completed a 65-mile ride by horse and mule to warn Rome that the Yankee troops are just outside the city at this time. It is now just a... Few minutes past 12 midnight, actually making it the early morning hours of May 3rd, 1863. Most of the Civil War is being fought in far off communities such as Chancellorsville, Virginia, and in both Arkansas and in Mississippi. There have been up till now no battles of any type near Rome, Georgia, a town of about 10,000 persons where most of the able bodied men and older boys have already been dispatched to other war zones. That is left in Rome mostly women children and elderly men and sick and wounded. Now, suddenly there is a crisis in this town. John Wisdom, a rural mail carrier, has just completed an almost unprecedented ride by horse and buggy, horse and mule back some 65 miles from Gadsden, Alabama, to warn Romans that Yankee forces are about to enter the town intent on destroying the noble cannon factory, burning our warehouses and supplies and stores and there just seems to be no one to help. However, our reporters have learned that just behind those 2,000 enemy forces is a band of some 400 men commanded by General Nathan Bedford Forrest, the noted cavalry officer of the Confederacy. Will General Forrest be able to stop this much larger force? Nobody knows at this moment. But here in Rome, the citizens have been roused out of bed. When Wisdom arrived in Rome, the first person he met was John Doyle. Mr. Doyle is the railroad watchman at the Wagon Bridge across the Etowah River at the foot of Broad Street. After telling Doyle the news, John then met with General George S. Black, the proprietor of the Etowah House Hotel. Then Wisdom rode up and down the streets on horseback, yelling to the Romans, The Yankees are coming! In every dark home, we see lanterns come on and folks come running out, many in bed clothes, to see what's the matter. Down by the river at the rail station... A steam locomotive has been fired up to make an emergency run to Kingston to gather up some help. Farmers with rifles are expected to climb on board and return to Rome to help fight. A large crowd is gathered around the Rome Railroad Station at the end of Broad Street, seeking transportation out of town by any means. The roads are dusty with buggies and wagons of citizens fleeing the expected onslaught of the Yankee troops. Meanwhile... Any able-bodied men and boys are forming marching groups in the main streets armed with broom handles, practicing short-order drill like soldiers, just to give the appearance of strength. Dozens of bales of cotton are being placed in the various wooden bridges leading into the city soaked with pine tar, ready to be burned down once Yankee troops try to come across the rivers. In some cases, citizens are using round stovepipes, which in the darkness look somewhat like cannons giving the appearance of a heavily fortified city. A line of breastworks is being laid out on the north side of the Ustanala River about a half mile from the bridge span. It is expected that by noon today, some 300 convalescing soldiers from Confederate hospitals on Broad Street will join with about 1,000 older men and boys behind the breastworks. The father of one young man in Rome lived on the main stage road to Jacksonville, Alabama, about 33 miles from Rome, and he picked up four Confederate infantrymen who were walking from Blue Mountain at Anniston on their way back to the front. Armed with shotguns and Navy pistols, they all headed at once in a two-horse wagon here to Rome. As Russell was coming into Rome, he encountered and captured a young man named R.L. Lindsay who was driving a team from Gadsden to Rome, 
and brought him with them into the Thornwood home of Colonel Shorter. Truly, Rome is wide awake at this early morning hour, and though they have no strength in numbers, they do have the will to tell the Yankees to go back home. How this will play out, no one knows. It is the early morning hours of May 3rd, 1863, and one would think it would be quiet in this peaceful little town of 10,000 people on the confluence of three great rivers. But not so. Rome is a beehive of activity at this time. More than once a locomotive stationed here has made an emergency run 13 miles over to Kingston and back, picking up farmers and elderly gentlemen all armed with rifles. Bales of cotton are now in place on all the bridges, many of them soaked with rosin and turpentine, ready to be ignited. John Wisdom, who rode horseback from Gadsden just to warn us, is taking a catnap at his mother's house, but he volunteered to help if someone would wake him when the Yankees came. And speaking of Yankees, our reporter is at the home of Colonel Alfred Shorter, just on the edge of town where a bountiful spring spouts forth many gallons of water. It seems that enemy troops have gathered there. Let's switch to our reporter at Colonel Alfred Shorter's home. As most Romans know, Colonel Shorter's fine home, Thornwood, on the entrance to the downtown area, has long been a watering spot for thirsty travelers and their horses. Today, there's a new kind of visitor on hand. Some 200 troops have made the trek in from Cedar Bluff, Alabama, where they left behind 1,800 other anxious men who want to come and burn down our city. Captain Milton Russell has been surveying the downtown area of Rome through a spyglass, and he obviously expected to find the city sound asleep. Instead, he finds trainloads of armed men coming in, steamboats fortifying themselves and probably holding some artillery. At least it looks like artillery, though it may just be stovepipes. Either way, Captain Russell cannot be sure. The bridges are all barricaded, and there are apparently armed men doing close-order drill on Broad Street. Frankly, I think they're armed with broomsticks, but I'd never tell that to the Yankee captain. This sudden change from a sleepy town that didn't expect company to an armed camp is apparently too much for the captain. A source told me that a black lady coming to work in the early hours might have saved the city and the lives of those behind the fake breastworks. It seems that Captain Russell asked the lady if the town had soldiers. She replied that there were nearly a thousand soldiers in the town and they were all heavily armed and added that even more were arriving by train. This news was definitely something the now outnumbered raiders did not want to hear. It appears that Captain Russell will now take his advance guard back to Cedar Bluff and warn Colonel Alfred D. Strait and his raiders that this will not be an easy task to take the town and burn the cannon factory. Reporting live from Thornwood, the home of Colonel Alfred Shorter, Rome's prominent businessman and educator. Well, a real surprise. Thanks to John Wisdom's ride and an early warning, Rome has all the appearances of being armed to the teeth, sufficiently enough to scare off an enemy force of 200 armed men and possibly the 1,800 men behind them at Cedar Bluff. We have a reporter standing by at Cedar Bluff, Alabama, and we'll find out what is taking place there. Stay tuned. Folks, this is a big news day in the short 29-year history of Rome, Georgia. This is the Sunrise Edition of News on the third day of May 1863. We've been with you all night, and you will not believe what all has happened during the past 24 hours. In a nutshell, 2,000 armed northern troops are at Cedar Bluff, Alabama, ready to move in and destroy Rome. 200 armed men have just come into Rome to take a look, did not like what they saw, and are now headed back to Cedar Bluff to report that taking Rome may be more than the Union forces bargained for. The reason they fell back is they encountered a small town all trumped up and apparently heavily armed. With dozens of soldiers in the street, fortifications all around on the various hills, and the ominous-looking cannons sticking out of every nook and cranny. They also know that if they start across the bridges... They themselves will be burned, as the big wooded covered bridges are soaked with turpentine and rosin. Not a happy scene for a conquering warrior. Now let's go direct to Cedar Bluff to find out what's happening there. Well, folks, if you think your story is strange back in Rome, you should be here on the banks of the Chattooga River, about 26 miles from Rome. In the middle of the night, Colonel Abel Strait was called out of his command tent by the armed forces behind General Nathan Bedford Forrest. 
It was Forrest's intention to meet with the colonel and suggest surrender. Forrest was betting that Strait did not know how few men he really had, less than 400, and virtually no artillery, just one little cannon. In a unique ruse in the darkness, Forrest made it seem to Strait that he had way more men and many more cannon. He did this by continually marching the men and the same cannon back and forth where Strait could see them as the two talked. It was a huge bluff, and perhaps someday it may be known as the Cedar Bluff. At any rate, it worked, and we have just seen Colonel Abel D. Strait hand his sword over to General Nathan B. Forrest. I don't have any figures, but this may be the largest surrender so far in this three-year war. Whatever, it certainly saved the city of Rome. That's the report from Cedar Bluff, Alabama, at the enemy encampment. Interesting turn of events. Now what will 400 men do with some 2,000 prisoners? Well, surely first they'll disarm them, and then march them into Rome and billet them in different locations until trains can come and pick them up for prison. It should be a triumphal entry into Rome led by the now very famous Nathan Bedford Forrest. We'll report all this if you'll just stay tuned to this recreation of these special events, particularly the heroism of Emma Sampson and the ride of John Wisdom. If Rome ever needed a brass band, it needs one on this bright and sunny morning. Some 2,000 enemy troops are slowly trudging their way into the city to be locked up in anything with a lock on the door. There are, of course, not enough jail cells to hold this vast supply of prisoners. Their arms have all been stacked and hauled to various locations around the city, lest the prisoners try to reclaim them. There is a very unique situation that, that developed just before noon upon the arrival of Forrest and his captured troops. For that story, let's go to our reporter in downtown Rome. There is already talk of how Rome will treat these heroes. A committee has agreed to find a beautiful silver service and give it to the John Wisdom family for his wonderful deed in coming to warn and ultimately save Rome. A huge picnic is being planned for next Wednesday to honor Forrest, and talk is that a portion of the city north of town will be renamed Forestville. Surely other remembrances will be fostered on this shy and retiring battle warrior. Every woman in town wants a lock of his hair. And one of his officers said that if Forrest does not get out of town soon, he would be bald. Word is that in spite of all the honors, once the prisoners are secure, General Forrest will be off to another venture to help save the South. No time for picnics when a war must be fought. The city has been so excited about the arrival of Yankee troops and with the knowledge that 200 men under Captain Milton Russell had already secured the Thornwood home of Colonel Alfred Shorter, the local population is being fed on rumor after rumor of what is happening. Unsure whether anybody was in chase of these raiders, the local town folks stopped General Nathan Bedford Forrest as he attempted to come into Rome, fearing that he was not who he said he was and he just might be a Yankee trick. Finally, his identity was secured and Forrest rode into downtown as a hero of great proportions. This is truly one jubilant place, Rome, Georgia, now one of the most famous places in the South, saved by a Paul Revere rider, aided by a 16-year-old girl, protected by a gallant general war hero, and secure, at least for a while, from any northern raiding parties. It has been a busy two days for us, and we thought we might get all of our reporters together and summarize what has happened and what we think the future holds. Yes, it has been a busy time on the airwaves. It all began when 2,000 northern troops, under the command of Colonel Abel D. Street, came across northern Alabama into the little town of Gadsden, crossed over a swollen creek, and then burned the bridge so any pursuing southern troops could not get across. That didn't work out as planned, thanks to a 16-year-old girl named Emma Sampson, who, when approached by Confederate Cavalry General Nathan Bedford Forrest, pointed a way for his men to get across the stream without danger. A brief shootout occurred as Forrest forded the creek, which killed his aide, Lieutenant Turner. Two Yankee riflemen were shot and killed at that encounter also. The young Confederate, 
is buried on the Samson farm place in Gadsden next to Elijah, Emma's father. Word is that the Alabama legislature will honor her deed with a land-grant gift of 350 acres of prime land. Meanwhile, a rural mail carrier from Gadsden, John Wisdom of Hoax Bluff, Alabama, comes back from his route to find the bridge burning. His personal ferry boat burned and sunk, and troops marching off toward Rome. Aware that Romans do not know they are coming and are not prepared, and that his own mother lives in Rome, he was determined to ride 65 miles and warn Romans. It took nearly 11 hours, five horses and one mule, but wisdom arrived in Rome just before midnight on April 2nd, 1863, in time to warn the sleeping city. His shouts that the Yankees were coming were sufficient to get everybody up, and they armed the city as best they could, making it look much more formidable than it really was. Meanwhile, Forrest is in hot pursuit of Strait and finds him and 1,800 of his men in camp for the night near Cedar Bluff, Alabama. 200 of the Yankee Raiders, under Captain Milton Russell, have been sent to secure Rome in time for the main army to move in on the day of the 3rd. Instead, Russell finds the city appearing to be armed and barricaded thanks to the early warning from John Wisdom. He defers attacking and instead takes his force of men and heads back to the main army at Cedar Bluff. General Forrest, meanwhile, approaches straight in the dark at the encampment and somehow convinces the gullible colonel that he is outnumbered. Actually, Forrest has less than 400 men while Strait has approximately 2,000. Nevertheless, totally spooked, Strait surrenders his command only to be absolutely flabbergasted when he learned what he had done in surrendering. Forrest then marches triumphantly into the city of Rome and is, is hailed as a conquering hero. That brought to an end one of the more unique sagas of this very, very unique civil war between the northern states and the southern states of America. Today, many years after this series of events took place, we look back to learn things that no one could have really known at the time. For instance, Emma Sansom. Many of the reporters thought the name was Samson. However, the Sansom family has lived there for many years in Gadsden, and the home place still remains there. She was honored as a real heroine, and in fact, she was nearly shot while riding behind General Forrest at the crossing of Black Warrior Creek, Alabama. The city of Gadsden honored her, as did the state of Alabama, which did grant her 350 acres of land. Gadsden named its major high school for her, Emma Sansom School, and a major thoroughfare, Sansom Boulevard, and a statue in marble of a young girl pointing the way. Even in Rome, Georgia, there is a Daughters of the Confederacy unit named after Emma Sansom. The little family cemetery in Gadsden, containing the body of Lieutenant Turner, remains where it always was. But now, both sides of busy Megan Boulevard transverse it just across from the Sansom School. The wild and woolly Black Warrior Creek is pretty tame these days, thanks to conservation and environmental measures, and seldom if ever floods as it did on that fateful day back in May. Later, Emma Sansom would move to Big Spring, Texas, and live a fruitful life, being buried in that city after her death. John Wisdom would continue his life, refusing to be acknowledged as any type of hero. And in fact, his deed, grandiose as it was, never received any acclaim because there was not room in America for too many Southern heroes in the years immediately following the Civil War. Actually, Paul Revere rode about 12 miles and saved a number of troops. Wisdom rode 65 miles and saved an entire city. A silver service was given in grateful thanks by the city of Rome, and that beautiful set of silver now has a place of honor in the Rome Area History Museum where it is seen each year 
by thousands of visitors. General Forrest would go on to become one of the great cavalry officers of all times of all wars. The city of Rome named its northern section as Forestville, a name still used by the Norfolk Southern Railroad for their northern rail yard. There was at one time a bank named Forestville Bank. Rome's most prominent hotel bore his name for years and now as apartments still uses the Forest name. His name fell into some disfavor in later years because of an understanding that he was instrumental in developing the Ku Klux Klan. Though there was a connection, it has never been shown that he was a Klansman in the sense that we think of Klan leaders today. And yes, Rome was saved. That is, it was saved for one more year. For a year later, on May 17, 1864, Rome was occupied by Union troops and held under martial law for several years. A great deal of lawlessness in those unhappy years caused death and fear, but Rome survived and grew to become a major Georgia city, a town of unique proportions of education, medicine, manufacturing, business, and culture. How can we judge what happened back in those days? Perhaps the best way is to read the words of one of Rome's finest historians, the late Roger Aycock. This is what Mr. Aycock said. As the war ended, Rome emerged from its second occupation with far less damage than most other conquered southern cities, largely because General Sherman surmised that the town might be needed again to house the later federal casualties. It requires only a mild stretch of the imagination to consider that if John Wisdom had postponed his trip to the gristmill on the morning of May 2nd, 1863, Rome might have been burned to the ground by Colonel Strait's raiders, and that if young Emma Sansom had fled from approaching federal troops on that same morning, instead of volunteering to lead General Forrest to the low water ford above the blasted bridge at Black Warrior Creek, the face of Rome today might be entirely different. This special broadcast has been made possible and was occasioned by the Rome Area History Museum and the National Creative Society. It was produced in the studios of Southern Broadcasting in Rome under the direction of General Manager Randy Quick, narrated by Dr. Charles Reichel, Mike McDougald, J.D. Duke, Kevin Daniels, Susan Cash, Tony McIntosh, and Jack Hatcher, reproduced by the National Recording Corporation and Johnny Carter. It was written in its entirety by Michael H. McDougald and depicted how it might have sounded if radio had been there in 1863. I'm Doug Walker.